I'm here to begin this space with some breath exercises. So I just ask that you relax your shoulders, relax your body. If you're sitting somewhere, please plant both of your feet on the ground so that we can ground ourselves in this space and just find the most relaxed way that you can be in this seat. I know we've been in so many chairs, we've been in so many spaces, but in this moment, we're gonna relax into this space and ground ourselves in the space. So. Please breathe with me and you can either repeat the affirmations or say them in your head. Take one inhale through your nose and deeply push it out through your mouth. Take another deep inhale through your nose and push it out through your mouth. Continue to breathe at your own pace. Inhale through your nose and outhale through your mouth. And I'm gonna say the affirmations of, I am here, we are here, they are here. Continue to take a deep inhale through your nose and exhale through your mouth. I am present, we are present, they are present. One more time, inhale through your nose and push it out through your mouth. I am protected. We are protected. They are protected. We're gonna do one more collective inhale through our nose. And exhale. I hope you feel grounded in the space with all the names that we are bringing into the space, with all the energy we are bringing into the space, just a reminder that we are here, we are protected, and we are seen in this space. Thank you all so much. And I'm gonna pass the mic. Thank you very much, Shelly, um, for that breathing exercise to make us come into a calm space. Good morning, everyone. My name is April Williams Luster, and I'm the Outreach Director for Congresswoman Robin Kepp. Thank you very much for joining us today for the Congressional Caucus on Black Women and Girls Forum, titled Not My Girls, addressing the issue of missing Black women and girls in Chicago, which is not just a Chicago epidemic, but a nationwide epidemic. Without further hesitation, I would like to introduce our esteemed moderator for the forum, award-winning Chicago Sun-Times columnist, Mary Mitchell. Ms. Mitchell is a recipient of numerous journalism awards including the Award of Excellence from the National Association of Black Journalists, the Stud Turpo Award from the Community Media Workshop, the Peter Lizagor Award from the Chicago Headline Club. And in 2011, Ms. Mitchell was inducted into Chicago Journalism Hall of Fame. And in 2020, she was inducted into the National Association of Black Journalists Hall of Fame. In 2019, after 30 years, Ms. Mitchell semi-retired, which is not really retired, but and now her column exclusively appears in the Chicago Sun-Times. Even after entering semi-retirement, Ms. Mitchell's columns continually raise community awareness about important advocacy issues, including criminal justice, political misconduct, and race relations. In several instances, her reporting led state legislators to strengthen laws protecting the rights of women and children. Just last year, almost a year from now, a year ago, on March 3rd, 2021, she wrote a column on the very topic we are addressing today titled, Police Activists Have to Work More Closely to Stop Crimes Against Black Women and Girls, stating that it would take both police and activists to do their jobs to reduce the horrible crimes against women and girls. Please welcome Ms. Mary Mitchell. You're muted. Got it. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I am honored to be here. Uh, this is such an important, important topic that, uh, you know, I just had to do it. Even if it's on a Saturday, I had to do it because it's such an important topic. Uh, right now, I want to introduce my Congresswoman and Congresswoman who is well known throughout uh, not only Chicago, but throughout the nation, because she's been such an advocate. She was first 
elected to serve the second congressional district in 2013. She's been a tireless advocate for Illinois families and has worked to expand economic opportunity, community wellness, and public safety across the state. She is known nationwide for her fearless, well, worldwide really, for her fearless advocacy for common sense gun reform and responsible community policing. Congressman Kelly is vice chair of the House Energy and Commerce Committee and serves on the Health, Energy and Consumer Protection and Commerce Subcommittee. Prior to her election to Congress, Kelly was a member of the Illinois House of Representatives, served as Chief Administrative Officer of Cook County and was Chief of Staff to Illinois State Treasurer Alexi Janulius, becoming the first African-American woman to serve as Chief of Staff to an elected const constitutional statewide office holder. But what I really, really love about Congresswoman Robin Kelly is that she has always been accessible to the community. She has always had uh, and used her power that she had to help Illinois families. Welcome Congresswoman Robin Kelly. Thank you so very much, Mary, my constituent, and I hope with the redistricting, you're still my constituent. Thank you for taking the time this morning. And I wanna thank everyone else uh, for being on the call for this very important forum. Uh, before I start, I just want to, uh, in front of everyone, embarrass my staff, April Williams Luster. This is her last day uh, in the office with me, and April has done a fantastic job. Um, I, I do like Mayor Lightfoot, even though she's taken one of my best staff. <laughs> but, um, but April, thank you so much for everything. Don't forget us. I know you won't, but um, thank you for the tremendous, tremendous work. Uh, that you have done. We we are a better office because of you. So I, I just had to say that. Thank you so much. So good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us to talk about this critically important topic. I want to start out by thanking my wonderful colleague, Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman, uh, for being here today. Um, our colleague, Yvette Clark, a co-founder, another co-chair, uh, she lost a member of her family, so she couldn't be with us today. And thank you, Mayor Lightford, for joining us also. We really, really appreciate you taking the time. I also want to thank our very distinguished panel of experts who we will hear from a little later this morning. And my sincerest gratitude to Chantanelle Howard, Sheila Bradley Smith, Karen Phillips, and Yolanda Frazier for speaking this morning and sharing your family stories and your own personal trauma. Thank you guys so much because you didn't have to do it, but you are. I know how painful this topic must be for you, but we can only move forward in improving the community preparedness and responsiveness for missing Black women and girls by learning how we need to improve. For those of you who still have children and nieces missing, I hope this event will also bring more attention to their cases. We're here today to talk about missing Black women and girls. We're going to talk about some women who are missing from our own community, the many factors that lead to Black women and girls being at increased risk of going missing, and why is it that Black women do not get the same attention or media coverage given to white women. We're focusing on Chicagoland today, but I want to underscore that this is a national problem. It's not just Chicago or Illinois, and it's not just black women. This is an issue for indigenous women, Latina women, and other women of color. But before I get into some of the data around missing black women, I do want to note that while this is the data that we have, black women's cases go underreported. The numbers I'm about to talk about are shocking, but I'm sure they don't even show the whole picture. The problem is likely much worse than we even know. In 2020, nearly 100,000 Black women and girls were reported missing. That means that Black women made up a little more than one third of all missing women reported last year, which is far higher than the population we account for nationally. However, we do not hear about these girls and women's cases. In a 2016 study called Missing White Women's Syndrome, law professor Zach Summers found that when Black people are missing, the media cover that with fewer stories in comparison with other demographic groups. We have the late iconic journalist Gwen Eiffel to thank for the concept of Missing White Women's Syndrome. 
Her work opened the door for an analysis, analysis of how news media cover missing people. Dr. Julia Jordan Zachary, a professor and chair of the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Department at Wake Forest University, wrote about the phenomenon of indivisibility and hypervisibility of Black women for the Washington Post last October. Hypervisibility means that Black women are disproportionately associated with negative stereotypes, like the welfare queen or the stigma of prostitution, and marked as deviant or requiring additional punishment. That's a factor in why missing Black women don't receive equal attention. What resonated with me about Dr. Jordan Zachary's piece is the idea she portrays that one of the contributing factors as to why Black women and girls' cases receive so much less media attention is that there is, as she calls it, a larger societal attitude toward Black women and girls in which the American body politic keeps us on the margins of society. I want us to talk a little bit about that today, as well as the other factors contributing to the disproportionate risk to our safety and personhood we face as Black women. These include increased risk of intimate partner violence. According to the Institute for Women's Policy Research, more than four in 10 Black women experience physical violence from an intimate partner in their lifetime. This is a higher rate than white, Latina, or Asian and Pacific Islander women. Black women also experience higher rates of psychological abuse, including humil humiliation and coercive control. More than 20% of Black women are raped in their lifetime. That's a higher share than women overall. And Black women face a particularly high risk of being killed at the hands of a man. According to the FBI, at least four Black women and girls were murdered per day in the U.S. in 2020. That is probably an undercount. When it comes to human trafficking, Black women are at an increased risk here as well. Through a two-year study of all suspected human trafficking incidents across the country, 40% of sex trafficking victims were identified as Black women. Sex trafficking numbers are very difficult to, relay, to rely on because of national or state level variation and how these crimes are reported. In many cases, a woman or child might be arrested for prostitution when they're actually being trafficked. trafficked. According to the FBI, 57.5% of all juvenile prostitution arrests are Black children. Implicit bias plays a hand here as well. Black women and girls have long faced misconceptions and bias of hypersexuality, leading society to downplay incidences of sexual assault, trafficking, and prostitution. We're also seeing a spike in violence against Black trans women nationally, which is tragic. In Chicago, we've lost Tierra Banks, 24-year-old Black transgender woman who was shot and killed in her car in Chicago last April. We've lost Tiana Alexander, a 28-year-old Black trans woman shot to death in Chicago on January 6th last year. In 2020, we lost 25-year-old Courtney Ashe Key. The list goes on and on. This is all very heavy, and we will continue getting into the factors contributing to this crisis this morning. I want to encourage you to take care of yourselves and take a break if you need to. Today is just one conversation we want to hold on this topic. We are listening closely today, and we're going to take your concerns and ideas back to Washington, D.C. Last year, I wrote to the Committee on Oversight and Reform, of which I am a member, to request a hearing on this very topic. We are expecting some committee action on this very soon, and I look forward to sharing more information with you about that in the next couple of weeks. Once again, thank you to our panelists and speakers for sharing their experience and expertise this morning. Thanks to our viewers for participating today. With that, I'm going to hand things over to my very wonderful colleague and co-chair and co-founder of the Caucus on Black Women and Girls, Congress, the fabulous Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman from New Jersey. Bonnie? Thanks, Robin. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for bringing us all together and doing this on a Saturday morning. I can't imagine anything more important to do, even on a Saturday morning. This issue is just so very, very startling to us. And, and the statistics that you just shared with us remind us of just how severe, how urgent our need is to get involved. And one thing I kept thinking when you were reading these statistics is that and still I rise. 
and still I rise and still I rise. And that's, that is exactly who we are. Um, the Congressional Caucus on Black Women and Girls was founded precisely because of that intersectionality of, 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 of race and sex and the fact that we were missing in many instances from the discussions of whether or not it was a policy or a legislative initiative. And we knew that we couldn't fix everything, but the three of us felt that we could at least be a platform for the dissemination of information and for the uh, discussion about how urgent these issues are. And when, a, when, when possible to you know, introduce legislation that specifically addressed the disparities in what was happening to black women and the urgent uh, violence that's happening to black women. And so from healthcare to education, to jobs, to just highlighting this issue here has been vitally important. And I thank you for bringing us together today. And, and I thank all of the experts on the panel for your willingness to share. And now, uh, Madam Mitchell, thank you for moderating us. But I tell you, I also want to thank those who are either survivors or members of families who wonderful women are still missing. You're absolutely right. We represented something like 34% of the missing women just in the, in this in 2020, yet we don't represent that in the population. We are uh, always always called upon to like buck it up and, um, and, and keep our mouth shut and be patient and, and things will happen. At the same time, the media doesn't, doesn't let you know what is happening in our communities. The media doesn't reinforce and, and, and repeat what's happening with our women who are uh, violently attacked or are trafficked or missing or killed or whatever. And law enforcement sometimes gets so busy that it feels that it's got other things that it needs to um, be involved in. I'm delighted that the mayor, your wonderful mayor, is on this call as well. I mean, I hear her on national news and she is standing up for our communities and she represents even me in the state of New Jersey. We may be in Chicagoland on this um, a virtual panel, but the problems that we're facing are nationwide. And so this is an opportunity to share that information. It is opportunity to even look at the uh, Protect Black Women and Girls Act, which establishes um, a strategic way of looking at our issues, determining where our resources need to be and what legislation needs to be passed. Um, I miss Yvette, my heart goes out to her, but we've got her back and she is with us because this is an important issue for her too. I commend everyone here for taking their Saturday morning and doing this. And I can't tell you how much I thank you for extending this invitation to me and how much I appreciate being your co-chair on the Congressional Caucus of Black Women and Girls. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, thank you so much. And now it's an honor to introduce uh, the mayor of the city of Chicago, Lori Lightfoot. Mayor, thank you for taking the time this Saturday morning. I know your schedule and I know you have uh, things that you have to run off to, but I also know this is a topic uh, near and dear to your heart and, and you're working to uh, improve it. And maybe we can learn, um, like we said, it's not just a Chicago problem, it's a national problem. And maybe we'll be able to take a page out of Chicago's book and be able to, you know, spread it around uh, the country. So thank you so much. I know you have a multi-agency plan to combat human trafficking. I'm not gonna say that, I'm gonna let you say all that, but I know you're also here to listen and learn. So thank you so much uh, for taking the time. I appreciate it. As I said, you know, only thing is you're taking my April from me, but otherwise, thank you for joining us. Mayor Lori Lightfoot. Well, um, thank you for uh, Congresswoman Kelly. Um, it's really a great honor for me uh, to be here with all of you today. Um, first and foremost, I want to give a thanks to you and the entire Congressional Caucus on, on Black Women and Girls for hosting this really important forum and conversation. Uh, Congresswoman Bo uh, Bonnie Watson Coleman, thank you so much uh, for your voice and for your advocacy. Um, it is resonating across the country um, and we've got to keep the work uh, going. I also want to uplift and spotlight uh, the victims, the survivors, and their family members who are joining us today, and the network of others um, in this space who are carrying extraordinary burdens. We need to do better 
for them, and we are committed to doing just that. Um, this is an issue that is personal for me. As a Black woman, as a mother of a Black daughter, I feel um, very connected uh, to the pain and suffering, but also the, the determination uh, that we all have to have and resolve to make sure that we um, don't just settle, um, that we demand um, our due um, and work hard to really ease the pain that families go through when their precious daughter, sister, or mother is ripped away from them and vanishes many times without a trace. And in Chicago, um, we just have to be honest and say, we don't have a good track record on, uh, on this topic of finding missing black women and girls, supporting their families or survivors, um, solving homicides related to black women. We absolutely must do better. Um, but you have my commitment um, that in my administration, uh, we are taking definitive steps, I think in the right direction to turn uh, these grim statistics around. And I'd like to share a few things uh, with you along those lines. We remain dedicated to investing and rolling out the resources that help bring justice to the mothers and aunts of missing women and, and girls, not just, um, not unlike the unspoken, outspoken brave women men, and women who are joining us here today. And to prevent more women and girls from befalling the same fate uh, for far too many. And let me just say, you know, we talk a lot in Chicago about the precious souls that are drawn to the streets. Um, and mostly when those conversations happen, we're talking about men of color, young men of color. But we also know that young women and particularly young women of color and black women are equally vi victimized <clears throat> by the circumstances that arise from poverty and the street crime and violence. And we cannot forget that as we talk about really thinking holistically about the plans that we need to impose in this city and making the right investments to turn around the lives of young black men and women and give them hope and opportunity that doesn't otherwise exist. So for example, Chicago is one of only three cities to have a fellowship to create a coordinated response to human trafficking. And I have to help, I have to thank our leader, um, Darcy Flynn, who has really, I think, opened up a lot of our eyes across city government on the terrible scourge of human trafficking and the challenges that victims and survivors face. Um, through her work, we help, uh, she helped us create the first ever citywide strategic plan to address gender-based violence, which was launched in September uh, of just last year. The plan builds, uh, seeks to build a muscle within city government to understand and address gender-based violence and human trafficking. And we all know that one of the um, terrible tolls of the pandemic is the skyrocketing numbers in domestic violence. Um, that is always a consistent challenge, but has gotten dramatically worse through the pandemic. And we seek to unmask that and address it head on. Our plan also brings together community partners, survivors, and city officials to design a citywide ecosystem that adequately prevents, responds, and intervenes in cases of gender-based violence and human trafficking in a trauma-informed way and culturally specific ways, and invest in critical services to stabilize survivors and increase um, safety. One of the things that we have invested a significant amount of resources in is to su uh, support survivors and victims of violence. Historically, city government has not invested in supporting these wounded uh, members of our community. And we have turned that around with our investments. And we have a full-time staff person, Stephanie Harris, who's dedicated to making sure that we are focusing city resources on supporting victims and survivors um, and this is a big, important step forward. And I believe that everyone has a role to play when it comes to ending the epidemic of missing Black women and girls and the cycles of violence that they endure. That's why our violence reduction plan called Our City, Our Safety intentionally targets domestic violence. That's why the Chicago Police Department is building out a detectives unit that specializes in human trafficking, and has built out a family liaison group of detectives whose sole responsibility is to work with families who have lost victims to violence. One of the things that we have heard over and over again from victims and survivors is 
after the initial push, they hear nothing else from the police department. I have pushed and demanded the police department to respond to this incredible need. I know this from personal friends who've lost loved ones and how desperate they need for that lifeline and that contact, even if it says we're still working on your case and we don't know anything. We owe the victims and survivors no less, which is why we have stood up, trained, and funded these detectives um, as family liaisons to make sure that that lifeline is there and secure for whatever these families need. In addition, my administration's Chicago Recovery Plan dedicates 25 million in new investments to support survivors of gender-based violence and human trafficking, and $10 million for short and long-term services designed to provide comprehensive, practical, and essential um, support to uh, survivors of violence and their loved ones, helping to address the deep and very real trauma faced by Chicagoans as a result of violent crime. Make no mistake, we have a lot more to do to bring justice and solace to the grieving families and desperately seeking answers. We also have a lot more to do to prevent the next family from being victimized. And so we are working on a multi-tiered strategy, investing real dollars and resources, but importantly, the tension that we need, intentionality that we need to make sure that we actually move the needle forward. And I am personally involved and committed to this work. And I'm confident that we are going to turn the corner from the sad story um, that has historically been the problem in Chicago. And today I recommit um, to all of you publicly that this is a top priority for our administration. You know, the old saying, put your money where your mouth is, we're doing that and we're committed. And we will continue to make sure that this issue of gender-based violence, um, missing uh, black women and girls, human trafficking remains at the top of our agenda. And particularly it's a critical piece of our community safety strategy. And the only way that we can get this done is by working together in partnership with the victims and survivors and their families, working in partnership with community-based uh, organizations and stakeholders who understand the need and the urgency, and we are committed to continuing doing just that. So I wanna thank Congresswoman Kelly and the team um, and the caucus uh, for providing a space uh, to deepen this conversation and collaboration. And I wanna thank you all for being part of this. And then I'm turning it back now to uh, the fabulous Mary Mitchell. <laughs> thank, thank you so, thank you so much, uh, Mayor Lightfoot for your comments. Uh, they're recorded on YouTube. So you know if people can go back and uh, hear it if you've missed it, if you're just getting in and tuning us in and checking in, this is what is important to know that these uh, uh, advocates have been working on this problem even we didn't know that they were working on it. They are now presenting information that we need to know in order to carry this forward. So thank you, Mayor Lightfoot, for joining us and, and, and sharing that information. Thank you so much, Congresswoman uh, Kelly, for pulling this all together. And thank you, thank you for Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman bringing a little flavor of Jersey with her to Chicago to let people know that this is not just a Chicago problem, this is a nationwide problem. With that, I want to introduce our next speaker. And she is a young woman who represents the young population in Chicago and across the nation who are concerned about this problem. Her name is Elia Harrell, and she's the winner of the 2021 Connect Her Film Festival. She is a high school senior where she maintains a 4.0 GPA. She's a passionate advocate for change. She served as president of the Agents for Change, a student activism group, and engages in several service projects as a member of the National Honor Society. Uh, she is an active member of Top Teams of America Skyline Chapter, and she serves as treasurer, well, she has served as treasurer for four years. Please help me welcome Ms. Ella Aria Harold. 
Hello, thank you all so much. And this is just an amazing event. Um, thank you, Mayor Lori Lightfoot for just coming on here um, and talking and, and spreading your um, kind of concern for this because this is such an issue that a lot of people don't understand how close it is, even if it hasn't affected you because it can affect anyone, which is what my film Amber is about. Um, you'll see um, a few series of events happen, but basically the main point of the film is to show that this issue is closer to home than we think, and we cannot wait until it arrives at our door before we care. So thank you. I do apologize, our Zoom froze um, right now. So we're just having a little tech technical difficulties. So I do apologize. As soon as we get that together, I don't know. Um, I'm pretty sure we could probably come back to it. Rachel, do you have it together? 72% of human trafficking victims are women and girls. Majority of victims are between the ages of 15 and 20. Women and girls are more likely to be trafficked as a result of the inequalities they face in the workplace, lack of education, and gender discrimination. parents home? No. Uh, I'm with the power company. I need to talk to your parents about some of the power line issues we've been having in the neighborhood. Oh my gosh. Are you ready? I've been calling you. I totally forgot. Let me grab my shoes. No, I'm sorry. They're not here. Okay. Did you get that Amber Alert? I mean, yeah. Those are always so sad, but there's not much we can do about it. And besides, I get those all the time. Yeah. Thank you. 
feel strange to you? Or what? I don't know. Something just feels weird. Okay. Let me get the door for you. Oh, thank you. Hi, are your parents home? I'm with the power company. I need to talk to your parents about the power line issues we've been having. Let's give her a hand just for the work that she's done in this area. Ari is going to be back with us on our panel experts where she will discuss uh, her film, her short film, and you will have a chance to ask her questions about uh, the film and how it's been received in the community. Thank you so much, Aria, for the work that you've done. Uh, right now, we want to uh, shift gears and we want to talk to the, the family members of people who have been missing and trafficking. And what I want to say here is that it is unimaginable what these families have gone through, uh, not knowing day to day what happened to their loved ones. This is someone's aunt, or someone's daughter, or someone's mother, or someone's friend who has disappeared and is missing and no one can tell them anything about it. They are here to share their story so that we are made aware and that we can get involved in helping to reduce and solve the problem of missing women and girls, black women, black girls in this country. Uh, so let me introduce them. And our first speaker will be Sheila Bradley, Smith. She is the aunt of Tianda and Diamond Bradley, missing since July 6, 2001. Ms. Smith? You're muted. There we are. Good, mor good morning, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Um, and Mayor Lightfoot, I see you there, and I see you, Mary. I see a, a host of wonderful people that's here willing to, her, to help. Um, I am the great honor of missing Tiana and Diamond Bradley. They've been missing almost 21 years out of the city of Chicago. At the time they became missing, there was an, an amber alert in place, but not given to Tiana and Diamond. And I didn't find that out until later. Uh, Tianda was three, I mean, it was 10, Diamond was three. <clears throat> it's been 21 years of nothing but pure hell, um, clanging, all kind of no, making noise, clanging everything, trying to get help from them, um, roadblocks, people, um, including some people in the community um, that stepped up. And, and at the same token, there were people in the community that didn't care. And some people to this day in Chicago still doesn't know who Tiana and Diamond Bradley are. 
they were missing off 35th Street right at Lake Park. Um, but after the first five years, I had a feeling that if we don't find these girls, that there will be more kidnappings um, and harm done to Black women and children. And it's sad to say that I've foreseen this moment in time concerning Black women and children, not only in Chicago, but throughout the United States, because there has just not been enough done to help our Black women and children. We have to fight with the media, sometimes fight with the police department in order to get their cases even listed as missing or runaways. Um, what I would like to really hope is that by um, you all forming this caucus, that it will be more than just talk. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have to say that because over 21 years, I've become an advocate for missing persons. I've found missing people. Unfortunately, a few people deceased. And I'm not even in law in in law enforcement, and there is no reason why if I can go out being uh, well, I hate to say senior, but spicy. If I could find a missing person, there is no reason why the police, the FBI, and the community should not be able to do that. And I'm just hoping that this will not stop here, that it would not just be something that we're doing to talk about it. I need to see boots on the ground, not just for Tian and Diamond. But for all these missing women and children, and people don't seem to care until it happened to them. Mm -hmm. Let's stop it before it happened to you. And the only way to do that is to, for the community to get involved, law enforcement to do what they're supposed to do, our government officials to mean what they say and to execute the plan that they claim that they have and to just stop brushing this up under the rug. Because it's not just, again, my nieces, you got postal workers missing, you got like, uh, Kira Cole, but then when a white woman goes missing, you get all of this media attention. You get it freely. You get everybody out there. But when our people, our Black children and women and men go missing, you get the bare minimum. It's time to do something about it. We need to do something about it. And if anybody has any information about the whereabouts of Tian and Diamond, we need to stop that cold of silence because silence is not golden. Silence might be deadly in my case. We need to open our mouths. You could call in a tip anonymously. You don't have to be on the forefront where people know who you are because if we don't stop it, it's going to continue and it's going to be worse. It's going to be worse. And I believe that if the city of Chicago has stepped up when Tian and Diamond got missing, just maybe we wouldn't have this epidemic that we have in Chicago and all over the world now. Thank you. Just step up, everybody. Just step up. Thank you so much, Ms. Bradley Smith. And uh, we will have a time for a QA. and uh, If you do have questions, please uh, don't hesitate to send them through the chat because we do want to have, want this to be a conversation and we want you to be able to express yourself on these topics. Uh, our next speaker will be Chantanelle Howard. Uh, she is the mother of Jerrica Laws who has been missing since August 17, 2015 from Park Forest. Ms. Howard. Hi, good morning. Um, I wanna thank Robin Kelly for this forum. Also Mary Lightfoot and Mary Mitchell. I used to read your columns as a young woman and I thank you so much for moderating and being a, a voice for us. Um, my daughter, Jerrica Laws went missing and I'm sorry, I started crying hearing Sheila's story. 
Mm -hmm. um, because I feel the same pain. But Jerrica went missing. She went for a walk in my neighborhood of Park Forest, Illinois, which is South Suburban Cook County on August 17, 2015. And she never returned home. Um, it was a, a difficult struggle because at the time, Jerrica was 20 years old when she went missing. And um, because she was not a child, there was no history of domestic abuse or there wasn't a history of drug ab abuse it took me um, a long time to get the involvement of the police, even though I went there multiple times a day. What I did as a parent was took to social media. I went on Facebook and I urged my friends and my family members and strangers to start calling the Park Forest Police Department in order for them to, to take a more active stance in finding my daughter. Because what the police officer told me was that they would just put her in a database called leads. And if, you know, she comes up or she's stopped or whatever, or, or the police stop her and, and then they'll, they'll, she'll be in there. So that would alert the police department. I, um, I even went to the hospital and, and, and asked if they had somebody there, Jane Doe, only to know, to find out that I can't find my baby, that only an officer can go to the um, hospital for Jane Doe. I, mm -hmm. um, when I took to social media, the calls began to flood the Park Forest Police Department. And I received a call from the, the person who took my uh, report. And he hung up in my face that day. He said, how are we gonna answer media calls and look for your daughter, which they were not about three to four days after going to the police station multiple times a day, they finally took her case seriously. But um, still to this day, um, I, I, I ask, you know, different questions. You know, we wa I've watched Law and Order and CSI and, and I was told, well, this is not like CSI. We don't involve the FBI agents. And, you know, it was my emergency, my urgency, but my local police department didn't share the same sentiments, even though we have been residents there for many, many years. She grew up there. Mm -hmm. um, but what I found um, to be very surprising is that, you know, they pull out all stops and it's sad because a missing loved one is still your baby, is still your aunt. I mean, color shouldn't matter, but it really does. It does matter. They pulled out all stops for this young lady. And I share, you know, my heart aches that her that she's deceased. But why not put, do that for my daughter? Jerick has been missing for six years, and I still fight with the police department. My calls go unanswered. My voicemails go unanswered. When I walk in the station, they say they're not available because they're behind a wall, so they can tell the clerk, "Oh, tell Miss Miss Howard we're not here today." I just want the same concern and care for my baby. But I, I'm a praying woman. I surely am. I'm a young praying woman, but I'm a praying woman. And I put her on the altar. And so I put them. I told one of the officers, I said, I know you have a number of cases on your desk because you don't want to anger them, right? <laughs> Even though I'm mad. Mm -hmm. I said, I know you have a number of cases on, on your desk. And I know Jerrica is probably on the bottom but she's at the top of mine. So I'm not going nowhere. <laughs> I'll be here. One day you'll realize, I said, and I told, asked them if this was your daughter, one of your brothers and blues daughter, family member, would you pull out all stops? He said, well, it's not, I just want to know. Mm -hmm. Would you do everything in your power? As long as I have breath in me, six years and almost six months later, I'll still be at your station, what have you done this month to look for my baby? I just want to know. But I'm thankful that I had a CEO. I worked for ComEd. And the CEO at the time took a special. I mean, she called me and I cried on the phone for two hours with this woman. And she said, I, I promise you everything that I know to do, any resources you need. They put Jerrica's information in 3.4 million ComEd bills. She, she, she assisted me in getting the billboards. Clear Channel agreed to do the billboards and ComEd did the, 
the the picture for the billboards to have the pixels right after the police would not even respond to Clear Channel. So the billboards went up. Uh, they did numerous searches, referred me to a place called Community United Effort to help the family of missing people as a way of coping and also provide resources to us. And that's how I met um, Norma Peterson and uh, actually was introduced to Sheila Bradley Smith. You know, and I want to leave you all with this is you never think you see these things happening and, and you may see a glimpse of it on TV. Right. You never think it'll hit your doorstep. But when it does. As a mother, parent, you just want the support when it does. It's like you can't move. You don't know what to do. You go to the people, the very people that's supposed to serve and protect to help you only to be turned away. And that's a shame that really is because they should be there to serve and protect and to assist. But in my case, with my daughter being 20 and I, someone else talked about the statistics that they're labeled these women, right? Mm -hmm. The guy said, well, what about a girlfriend? And I mean, a boyfriend. And I said, well, I don't believe. And, you know, kids do all kinds of stuff that you, the parent may not know. But I don't believe Jerrica had a boyfriend. I took her computer. They said, does she have social media? I said, no, she didn't. Now, I have social media, but Jerrica didn't. She was into church, into the Bible, uh, volunteering in the community. She was saving herself for marriage. But that police officer, they did not believe me until they got her computer. They saw that she was uh, going to church, on the, watching church, and they did a history. There was no Facebook. There was no sex sites. There was no nothing. He didn't believe me when I was telling him until he had evidence. So it's like he put her in a category of a certain black woman when she wasn't. I just want to thank you all for having this forum. And I hope and pray that it's something else that comes as a result of this, that you don't forget our message. Because it's not just my baby. It's not just the male curious daughter. It's not just the, the Sheila Bradley Smith's nieces. You know, it's so many women that's missing. Lastly, I did a missing person event in 2018 in, a, in my town of Park Forest. And I did a board and I posted everyone within a five mile radius because the towns, you could go north and you're in Olympia Fields. You could go east, you're in Chicago Heights. You could go south, you're in Bristol Park. Little south, you're in South Village. And I posted pictures of all young ladies, men, older, that went missing. And the police asked me, how did you get this information? It was a girl going missing in our community every week. Mm. But the, the police departments didn't talk to each other. They just missing in Richmond Park, but they didn't reach out down the street to Park Forest to say, hey, we got this missing girl. You know, it's sad. But I thank you all for this forum and please don't forget us. Please don't forget us. Let's do something about it. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Howard, for that um, testimony. Uh, and, and I'm sure that it is going to help someone because you never know. Today is not your problem, you think. But you never know when it's going to affect you. So thank you so much for sharing that. I know it wasn't easy. And may God continue to bless you and keep you and we will remember you in our prayers. Our next speaker is Karen Phillips. Karen Phillips is a mother of postal worker, Kiara Coles, who has been missing since October 2, 2018. Ms. Phillips. Hi, I'm Ms. Phillips, the mother of Kiara Coles. Um, yes, Kiara Coles went missing on October the 2nd, 2018. You know, I talk to my kids every day. And it was just so funny that the day that I called her all day, she didn't answer her phone, which I found that strange, you know, in the beginning anyway, because for a person that loves social media and taking pictures of herself, she would have never let her phone went dead. So I instantly got worried. So mm -hmm. I went and checked on her, you know, during my lunch break. She wasn't at her house, so I figured she was just, you know, gone and she hadn't plugged up her phone. But by the time I got off work that evening, she still had an answer. I knew it was something wrong. So I went to her apartment to, you know, go check on her. 
just to make sure because she did just announce she was pregnant. She was almost three months and she was so excited. I had talked to her on the first. She was at the Wix store. She didn't know what to get. You know, she was just in there just, you know, excited. She was one of the last of my kids to have a baby. So we was all excited for her. So on the second, the evening that I made the missing person report, I went to her house. I called the police. They came out to do a well-being check. When we went in the house, where well, I didn't go in because I was too nervous to go up. I let them go in. And the boyfriend at the time, he went up with them. So when they came down, they was like, no, Kiara. So then I got to thinking like, oh, wow, you know, she's probably just outside. She's going to be mad. I got her house. You know, I let them break into, get into her house. You know, I let them get into her house. So I went home, went to bed. When I got up that morning, it was no call from her. I knew it was real. And I also knew by my daughter being the color that she is, it wasn't going to be much help. And we need to do all that we can do. So family, friends, all of her friends, we started doing the search. We got flyers made out. We started putting the flyers up. At the time, the boyfriend said he'd do everything he could to help. After that day, we haven't seen him since today. He still haven't went in and been questioned by the police. And my thing is, if you ain't had nothing to do with it, why not go and clear your name to ease us? You know, because you know what we're thinking about now. Three years and three months later, you know, I feel robbed because as my girls growing up, I have four daughters. You know, I always want to protect them from being molested or touched or anything. And I felt like I did a good job bringing them up and none of that happened to them only for her to move out. She only was gone about three months. And then for her to just come up missing and there's no help from the police, of course, of course, they came out that day, but after that day, it, it's, it's nothing. Every time I call, they out. They on vacation. They have more vacations than anybody that I know. They never return a phone call. I have requested my daughter's records twice because I want to get a private investigator. They won't respond back to that. It's just no type of help from the Chicago Police Department at all. You know, it, it's just sad because I knew in the beginning that my daughter case was going to go unheard. You know, only time it's heard if the news people reach out to me more than Chicago police. In two years, Chicago police haven't called me and said anything to me. Well, one minute they say the case is closed. The next minute they say, oh, no, it's not closed. We just don't have no evidence. That's when everybody get to calling them. Then it's not closed. We don't have no evidence. But as her mother... It's some evidence that I feel is strong enough to bring Mr. Simmons in, but they telling me it's not enough. And I'm sure that that's enough evidence because I've seen people get convicted on less evidence than, you know, what they got for my daughter. Mm -hmm. But, you know, because she's the color that she is, her evidence, that evidence don't mean nothing. You know, it, it's, it's just, it's really sad. I have to wake up with a different pain every morning. If I get a different number on my phone, I don't know if that's the police department, the morgue, you know, somebody else. It's, it's just terrifying every day to walk around not knowing if your daughter's safe, warm. Did she have her baby? I wasn't there. I was with all of my girls when they had their kids. You know, I know about as close as me and my girls was, uh, you know, she was looking for me. And, you know, for me to let her down because I wasn't there and I'm trying to do it. All that I can to, you know, bring my baby home, whether it's, you know, whatever way it's going to be, just to bring her home, you know, and I don't have no help from the police department at all, period. They don't care about Black women at all. And it's just sad. And I thank everybody that put this platform together and including me to tell my story because anybody that called and asked can I do an interview, I would drop anything to talk about Kiara to hope somebody at one time say, you know, I'm going to get this family what they looking for. You know, it's just sad that people can sit around. You would rather hold trust that somebody hurted another human being than to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. It just, you know, it's just sad that me and my other kids have to go through this every day. Um, Mary, may, may, I, may, I, uh, may I address Ms. Uh, Phillips? Yes. Ms. Phillips, um, 
I remember your daughter's case and I am so very sorry for your pain. Now, as I said in my remarks, as a mom myself, every single day, I worry about my daughter. I worry what harm could come to her. I, I worry like every mom worries. And it's painful to, for me, <clears throat> not only to feel your pain and hear your, your feelings, but to know that you have not been treated well by the Chicago Police Department. So here's people that know me know I'm a person of action. So I will make sure if you put your contact information in the chat, I have a number of my um, staff that are on this call. You will get a call from the chief of detectives this weekend. Okay, we will, thank you. We will, we will move forward because this, okay. is, this is absolutely unacceptable. It's unacceptable. And I've been very clear with them about that. No family should have a dead end when it comes to the Chicago Police Department, at least being responsive. Even if the answer is, I don't have an update. It's, right. But I, you're, you're, I've spoken to um, the head of the Postal Workers Unions about your daughter's case um, then and recently, but we will, we will work to get you some answers. This is unacceptable. Okay. And I'm not gonna let this happen on my watch. Okay. So again, if you put your, um, or maybe uh, April, you can connect us with Ms. Phillips. Um, I will make sure that you get uh, some answers starting this weekend. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mayor Lightfoot, Thank for addressing it in real time. And that's what happens when you can have a conversation. And when that conversation includes everyone, all the stakeholders, you know, the moms, the sisters, the elected officials, the journalists. I will definitely respond to some of the questions you've asked about journalism and our role that we play in this uh, crisis. So thank you so much, Mayor, for uh, responding. We appreciate it. Thank yes, you. we do. I definitely appreciate you. I really do. Thank you. So I mention right now to Tina. I'm sorry? I said, I'm sending that information um, to Tina right now. Oh, okay. Thank All right, you. so what we want to do now is- hey, Mary. Uh, it's Robin, sorry to interrupt. Also, I just um, wanted um, um, Ms. Howard to know that um, uh, there's other people listening uh, from Park Forest too. So hopefully uh, you'll hear. Thank you so much. All righty. Thank you, Congresswoman Kelly. You're welcome. Um, so what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna take a, a small break uh, to do some breathing exercises to bring back the calm in the space. And after that, immediately following, we're going to uh, be treated to a creative performance by Taya Bolton. Uh, she is a part of Girls for Gender e Equity, a national agenda for black girls. So immediately following uh, the breathing exercise, we're gonna ask Taya to come forward. Thank you very much. I'm gonna turn it over to Shelly. Um, thank you to everyone who is in this space. Um, thank you for showing up in the emotions that you show up in. Everything is as firm as it is valid in this space. Um, what I'm going to do for this moment right now is to ground us in our root chakra. If you don't know anything about chakras, it just has to do with energy. And the root chakra is the base and the foundation. And it has to do with safety and home and feeling protected. So in this moment, I've seen many people say my heart goes out and they've been talking about their hearts. So thinking about like the warmth and the love that's in your heart, but also thinking about the foundation of folks' home being shaken up, folks waking up in their home and their foundation not being the same as it was before. So bringing in some root chakra energy um, for some love around the home. So I'm going to play something called a sound bowl and you'll hear the sound as I'm playing the sound bowl then we'll be breathing during that. So at your own pace we're going to begin again just taking a deep inhale through your nose and push it out through your mouth. 
This time, when we take the inhale through the nose, when we push it out through your mouth, I want you to make a sound. Release for whatever sound you need, whether that is a loud sound of joy or whether that is a, a sound of frustration. So many people have been doing this work for so long. It could be whatever emotion you feel. So this time, take a deep inhale through your nose. When you push it out, make whatever sound. Ah. All right, one more deep inhale through your nose and make whatever sound you need for this moment. So I'm gonna play the sound bowl. And as I play it, I'm gonna read some affirmations that the young folks from Girls for Gender Equity have created just to affirm the root shocker and affirm who you are in this moment, wherever you are in this moment. You can continue to deeply inhale through your nose, exhale through your mouth, bringing in any energy you need to come into your body and pushing out any energy that you do not want in your body. First affirmation is, you are more than your suffering. You are more than suffering, more than the pain and the labels the world have placed on you. You are something more, something great, something often duplicated, but never replicated. That is an affirmation for Sha from Shakima. You are visible even when you feel invisible. Your voice is equally and uniquely yours, filled with potential to go beyond your limits. Taking another deep inhale through your nose and pushing it out through your mouth. I will make space for myself without the fear of stepping on toes. You are more than your bad days. You are cherished, appreciated, and loved more than you know. And with that one, we're gonna take one more deep inhale through our nose and pushing it out through our mouths. Um, so continuing to ground us in this space, grounding us for the intentions we have for this space and affirming all of those who are in this space, affirming the energies of those who are present and the energies of the names that we are calling outside of this space wherever they are in the world to affirm their energy and their existence to be important in this moment, in this space. Thank you all so much for this. And I am tossing the mic back over to Ms. Erica. Thank you so much. Okay, and now we'll hear from Talia. Um, hello, everyone, for having me. Um, thank you, ladies, for sharing your stories. Um, um, I know that takes a lot of strength, but also a lot of vulnerability. So thank you for allowing me to share the space with you all. Um, I wanted to share um, a poem called You Are Not Alone, Black Girl. It goes like this. Black girl, you are not alone in this world, though sometimes it feels true. Black girl, you are beautiful from your head right down to your shoe. Black girl, you're invested with the power of the wind, the calmness of the water. Black girl, it's okay to be vulnerable. We are all just somebody's daughter. Black girl, you are enough. Your hair so beautifully curled. Black girl, you are the thunder. You are the rain. You are the world. Um, NABG has been a beautiful opportunity to build a sense of community amongst young girls and black women um, like myself. I've had the pleasure of being a part of NABG since March of 2021, and it has been such an educational experience, but also a very personal one as well. While getting involved with many initiatives from policy to paneling, I've been able to form very important bonds with the family here and engage with many different experiences. It has been a great space that has helped me acknowledge the importance of self-care. Um, it has also been great in ensuring the well-being of all of its members, 
which relates to an NABG policy priority of healing, well-being, and reproductive justice. Young women of young women of color who live in poverty receive mental health treatment at less than one third the rate of young white women living in poverty. In 2011, the risk of death from pregnancy complications was nearly three and a half times higher for black women than for white women. It's important we acknowledge these statistics as a feature of a system that currently doesn't acknowledge us. Our prize policy priority asserts the idea that black girls need access to the life-saving services provided by mental health and sexual and reproductive health facilities. Basic services as a first step into allowing for basic regard to be attended to our girls. At National Agenda for Black Girls, we believe there is a fundamental demand for the changes that the policy entails. Thank you. Thank you. Give her a hand. Thank you so much for being involved. It is, it is so gratifying to see young people, to see young faces uh, on this, at this workshop. Uh, because, you know, I'm 70 something years old. And for me, I've done the work, but now we have to pass it on to young people so they can continue the work. We have to show them uh, how to get it done. And we have to encourage them as they try to solve some of these problems. And with that, uh, I want to do a commercial break. And this commercial break is to thank uh, the Congressional Caucus on Black Women and Girls for putting this uh, event together and for allowing us to come together in this space and talk about something that is so important to our community. I also want to give you guys a little, just a little synopsis of journalism's role and this crisis. I can tell you as a, a longtime journalist that it is very, very humbling to hear your stories because one of the, 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 one of the things you say over and over is that we can't get media attention and that white women who go missing get all the attention, but black women who go missing doesn't. And one of the things that I want to share with you is the fact that that is a really a, a, a condition of not having enough black people in media, period. If you walk into some of these newsrooms, they have returned to being basically white. And as a journalist, when we go out to do stories and stories are assigned to us, or we want to work on a story, we have an editor that tells us whether we can do it or we can't do it. So the first thing we have to address is why isn't a missing black woman news? Why is it news when a white woman is missing, but it's not considered news when a black woman is missing? And I gotta tell you, you have advocates in the newsroom who fight for space to tell those stories. So what I would suggest you do, if you are involved in the work of, of trying to stop the, 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 the tragedy of more than 50 something women, black women been missing since 2018. If you're involved in that work, when you have an opportunity, contact the editorial boards, bring it directly to the editorial boards, bring it directly to the newspapers. Why aren't you doing this? Because when you write or call or text or email the editors uh, and the owners of these newspapers, they respond. But if they don't hear from you, if you don't complain to them directly, if you don't call the news people, if you don't do that, then they think they, can, they don't have to report it. That's number one. Number two, when you see an article about a missing black woman or girl that's in the paper, call up that reporter and make contact with them. Encourage them to continue to report on this issue. Give them the information that you have. Because when you don't do that, then it's like we don't have anybody advocating for us and helping us to get that job done. If you have questions about a story and how it was written, how it was framed, how it is, whether or not that is trying to shame black women or unintentionally shame black women who are missing, you need to, re you need to complain about that. You need to talk to editors about that because once they hear from you, then that's how change happens. 
So I got to say that for on my part, I've learned and grown over the years in terms of covering this issue. This issue goes back to a diamond, uh, a diamond Bradley, the missing Bradley girls. You know, we were we were basically late. We showed up late, and we didn't stick to it. Uh, with with uh, Kiara Coles and and that uh, uh, those that missing girl situation, we showed up late. But it's on us to continue to advocate, even though it's very difficult. So that is my commercial break. And if uh, you guys want to take a break. Uh, right now so that we can get into the next part of our uh, uh, program. And that is the moderate a panel of experts who you are gonna be able to hear from and you will be able to question. And we're gonna take two minutes, maybe three minutes for you guys to take your break and then we'll uh, reconvene right here. All right? That's if you need to stretch your legs, take a, a bathroom break, drink some coffee. <laughs> you have time to go grab it.
Okay, well, welcome back. Uh, if you're just joining us, this is the Congressional Caucus. This is a, an event put together by the Congressional Caucus on Black Women and Girls. And we are talking about missing Black women and girls. Since the year 2018, or in the year 2018, we were talking about 55 missing Black women and girls. That number has grown, definitely grown since then. And now, uh, thanks to Congresswoman Kelly and uh, Congresswoman Coleman and Congresswoman Yvette Clark, we have an opportunity now to talk about um, this subject that's very important to our communities. Uh, we want to move now to a panel of experts on this subject. And I'm going to introduce all of them and give them an opportunity to tell them a little bit about what they've done in this space. And uh, we're gonna ask them questions, post questions that will help us really think through what we can do on our own uh, to address this issue. So our panel experts uh, will begin with Dr. Keisha Roberts Tab. She's Cook County Human Trafficking Specialist and founder of Girls Night Out. And we just wanna give her an opportunity to tell us a little bit about herself and, and the work that she does before we get into questions. I'm Dr. Kisha roberts Tab. I've um, uh, been with Cook County Juvenile Court for the past 19 years, always worked with gender responsive population. However, I never understood what I was seeing in that population when girls went missing. We didn't have words, we didn't have a name for trafficking. And so, um, we, what I have been doing is I've studied and researched. I got my PhD with a dissertation around attitudes and perceptions around trafficking victims because I think it's important that we first understand what those attitudes and perceptions are around trafficking victims and why they exist. If we're going to tackle the problem, we have to be able to face the problem head on. I founded Girls Night Out because I felt that, like most of the, um, most of the testimonies that we heard, when we speak about black girls in our community, we don't get the same traction. And until we go to the streets and demand that someone listen to the fact that we have these girls that's being exploited in le legitimate um, businesses and hotels and motels in our community, we will never get anything done. And so Girls Night Out was my call to action. And I brought the pro I went where the problem was. I no longer want to go in communities where people feel sympathetic for you know our situation and you know get that guilt off of them. I wanted to go where the problem exists. And I wanted to say that we will no longer stand for the exploitation of our women and girls in our community. And I bought the community out. We've done this for the last four years. Um, as a community psychologist, I thought it was important that um, we be boots on the ground around the issues concerning our young people. And so I am also an author. Uh, my second book, Who's Little Girl To Anyone With Money To Buy, is a book around exploitation and black women and why and how they are exploited in our right on client site. So thank you for having me. Thank you to the Congress women for putting this together. And thank you, April, for inviting me. Thank you so much for that. Uh, our next speaker is Brenda, our panelist is Brenda Myers Powell. She's co-founder and executive director of the Dreamcatcher Foundation and author of Leaving Breezy Street. Hi, thank you for inviting me and I'm so glad to be here. Um, I am uh, the co-founder and executive director of the Dreamcatcher Foundation and we deal with human trafficking. Our, um, our foundation is outreach. We go to the belly of the beast. We go out to meet the young ladies where they are. We started in uh, 2014. We have been in grounds, boots on the ground <laughs> since then. Um, we believe in uh, going out to the young ladies and meeting them where we're at. Um, 
in the wee hours of the morning when everything is happening and people are in their beds, when the city becomes uh, a total, a total uh, uh, becomes another animal, uh, when, uh, when you're asleep, we're out there with, with um, the population that's out there in the street. We are out there from, 12, from 11 at night to five and, uh, five and six o'clock in the morning. We meet the population where they're at. So we've been doing that for quite some time for uh, since 2014. We have, we have a drop-in center. We uh, do prevention and intervention and education on human trafficking because we understand our population well, is survivors. We are survivors and mm -hmm. our company, our, our organization is survivor led and we have survivors on our teams because who better to understand these ladies than people who have been through it. So we are out there boots on the ground. We've been doing that for quite some time. And our motto is that crisis does not make an appointment. We believe that um, it's a 24-7 job so that we have our, 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 our staff out there 24 seven. We don't just do human trafficking. We started out doing just human trafficking and we found out way back in 2014 that girls were being missing and murdered. And on our van, we have pictures of young ladies because we had parents walking up to our van asking us could we find their daughter could we find their child because we they knew that we were out there in the middle of the night so we keep pictures on our van of missing girls so that we are likely to find them and we'll run into them in the wee hours of the night in the uh uh, uh morning uh, because the police are not looking for them so the dream catcher foundation looks for them so we've been servicing the community and that order for many many years so we thank you and we're um just happy to be a part of this um, committee, I mean, um, this panel. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, taking the time uh, to come out and educate us, basically, on your organization. Um, the, the next speaker will be Shahrazad Tillett. Hi, thank everybody for uh, organizing this panel. And I also really, really want to sincerely thank the, the, the families. Um, if you're joining in right now, I really ask you to um, witness and watch and listen um, the call of action that the families um, shared with us. Um, my name is Shahrazad Talad. I'm the co-founder of A Long Walk Home. I founded A Long Walk Home along with my sister, Salamisha Talit. Um, she's a survivor of sexual assault. And we've been doing this work since 2003. Um, a lot of the people uh, that I admire are on this call, uh, this panel with us today. Um, we are one of the largest organizations in the country that does work to empower black girls to end violence against women and girls. Um, and so I would say, because we are an organization about leadership development and empowering black girls, unfortunately, one of the issues that we have to focus on is missing and murdered um, girls as well. It's an issue that came to us um, because of the real impact um, that has been happening to our young people that we work with, uh, whether their friends or family members have gone missing, um, uh, the urgency, the, the, the crisis, I, um, I urge everyone today. So I'm just really happy to be here to really create awareness around this issue. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Shannon Parker is Director of Strategic Partnerships of Howard Brown Health. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, good morning. I'm Shannon Parker um, of Howard Brown Health. I do community, I'm the Director of Community Engagement and Strategic Partnerships. So I have worked personally um, with transgender populations for a long time. Um, actually, Brenda and I used to work in the county jail together, um, working with vulnerable populations in protective custody. So Howard Brown Health um, services primarily LGBTQ populations centering around their health needs. Um, and we can look at health in a very narrow lens, right, about tr a traditional model. But we also have to think about how we think about health from a public safety standpoint, which does include the lives of trans women. Um, what we know is that trans women by leaps and bounds experience so much violence, whether that's interpersonal um, or whether that is physical or whether that is actually death, 
right? Um, oftentimes, trans people are a very forgotten population. I don't like to use the term invisible because as a trans person, you see my hand in front of this screen. So I am no doubt invisible. Um, what it is, is that we are oftentimes an expendable population. Um, we have a tendency to project and say, well, you somehow did that to yourself. So therefore what happens to you is of your own accord, right? So again, um, thinking about how we actually navigate creating better opportunities for trans folks, how we include them in those conversations and recognize the fact that um, many of the experiences that are being shared here do in fact happen to the populations that I serve and that Brenda has served and so many others. So I'll digress there. Um, and again, thank you for having me and I look forward to our continued conversation. Uh, we, we are going to have a join in our panel Aria Harrell, you saw her earlier. She had did the uh, short film Amber, and she'll have a chance to talk about that in this next session. Uh, but right now, we want to welcome Candace McCullum. Uh, before uh, we get started, she is the radio host of WVON, host of the Invisible Ones, a five-part radio docu series following the cases of missing women in Chicago. Uh, we're going to play a clip of that docu-series uh, before Ms. Uh, Candace McCollum speaks. The most unprotected one, the person in America is the Black woman. The most neglected person in America is the Black woman. Malcolm X said those prophetic words 50 years ago. 50 years later, they still hold true in almost every aspect of life for Black women. And while America's news cycle remains obsessed with missing white women, WVON is shining the light on our missing and murdered young girls and women in Chicago. Who are they? What happened to them? What are their stories? And why does the media have a double standard for Black women who have vanished without a trace? I'm Candace McCollum, and this is The Invisible Ones, when Black women go missing. In this series, you'll meet some of the women who are missing or who have been murdered, and we'll talk to their families. We will explore whether Chicago has a serial killer amongst us, and what role sex trafficking may play in their disappearance. And finally, we'll talk about what is being done at the local and federal levels to address this issue. Say their names. Angela Mariana Ford, Charlotte W. Day, Winifred Shines, Saudia Banks, Bessie Scott, Jody Grissom, Latanya Keeler, Lorraine Harris, and Nancy Walker. These are just 10 of 51 Black women who have been murdered or who have gone missing in Chicago since 2001. Today, you will hear the story of Nancy Walker. The local media has refused to tell her story, so we will. Nancy Walker was the eldest of six sisters. She was born on August 15, 1947 in Birmingham, Alabama, where she attended grammar school before her family moved to Chicago. Growing up, she and her sisters loved to eat cookies and ice cream. In high school, Nancy was captain of her cheerleading squad and later studied jazz and ballet. In college, she majored in accounting and stayed true to her love of dance by opening her own studio in Inglewood, where she taught yoga and jazzercise. Walker, like all missing and murdered black girls and women in Chicago, was loved and cared for deeply by her family and friends. They were devastated when they couldn't find her and began a frantic search for her whereabouts. But when the police stepped in to begin their investigation, there was no urgency to this matter, and it seems it rarely is, when the victim is of color. Seven weeks after Nancy went missing, her body was found, dismembered on the Bishop Ford. She was only 55 years old. Nancy Walker is one of 51 women highlighted in the Unforgotten 51 Project, started by Roosevelt University professor John Fountain and his students in 2019. We must tell our own stories, that it is imperative for us to be the eyes and the ears telling the stories from the inside out rather than the outside in with a perspective that is not jaded in the sense of not understanding 
representing uh, the people who live in the communities whose voices are not heard. Fountain is also a reporter for the Chicago Sun-Times. The purpose of the Unforgotten 51 Project is to investigate and humanize those victims whose bodies, who in most cases have been discarded in alleys on the west and south sides like garbage, as if they didn't matter. All right. So thank you so much for that. Um, we are going to now delve into some questions for our panel. And if you have questions, please put them in the chat. I have some questions I want to ask, but please put them in the chat and that way we'll be able to address them. Uh, I want to start off with Ms. McCollum. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I am doing well. How are you? Okay. Uh, that is that was a, a, a very interesting clip that was played uh, because I thought it was so ingenious the way John Fountain used this classroom to mm. actually expose uh, the, sh the shortcomings of major media when it comes to addressing this issue. So my question for you is, what is the common misconception around sex trafficking within communities of color? You know, quite well, thank you for having me today. And thank you for this panel and putting um, this together. It's very important. I, I think that one of the most misconceptions, honestly, is, and, and for me too, is I don't think a lot of people know just how much sex trafficking does affect the Black community. I think when we think of sex trafficking, I think we think of the white community. For me, I had no idea that sex trafficking was as big um, in Chicago as being a major hub. Um, I did not know that it affects young black girls and women. So doing this series and diving into the possible reasons as into why our young women and girls are missing, it opened my eyes to, to a lot. So I do believe that is probably one of the bis, biggest mi misconceptions of sex trafficking. So I learned a lot. I did get to talk to Brenda Myers Powell and she gave me a lot of information. So later in the series, it is a five-part docu-series. I think episode four we or three, we focused the whole nine minutes on my conversation with Ms. Powell. And I, I'm hoping that not only did I educate myself, but that episode also educated a lot of people because I, I don't think a lot of people know just how much sex trafficking does affect our young girls and women. Uh, Brenda, you want to jump in here and uh, answer that same question? Repeat the question. The misconception, or what would be the misconceptions about sex trafficking in our, the, uh, in our community and communities of color? Well, first of all, they don't consider it sex trafficking. They, they, they just, it's so normalized in our communities. We, we kind of just accept it as uh, something that is a part of our communities uh, from day to day. And we, uh, we don't know this, we, we don't, ex we don't just know the seriousness of it and how it's affecting our boys and girls mm -hmm. on a daily basis. We, 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 we kind of like accept it as a part of us and we, we have to stop that. It's not a part of who we are. It's not a job. It's not a part of our culture. It's not a part of who we are. And we have to stop passing it down generational. We have to stop telling our young girls, this is something that you can do with your bodies. This is not something that you can set up for a career. It's not that. Too, for too long, we have passed that down generational as some as something that our kids can be a part of as a, as as a way to survive and make money we have to stop serving our children on the platter as as sex objects as 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 as, as sex slaves to, to to in in our community this has to stop we give them bad information we give them uh information that was passed down to us. And I guess some people say, it, well, it was all right for me. I can pass this information down, but we have to stop the generational part that is, 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 is a part of, uh, of human trafficking. Um, we have to stop the things that uh, uh, um, create human trafficking, like adultifying our girls, um, 
um, not allowing him to, to have a childhood, um, giving them roles that are, are way too um, ex, uh, 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 experienced for them and they're not ready for. They're not, they're truly not ready for. We put our kids in, in, in adult situations and along with them adult situations come adult posi uh, 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 positions and sexualize them way too early. We have to allow our kids to be kids. And, 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 and we're not doing that in our communities. Our kids are put in positions with, uh, of, of, of adult situations where, and along with those adult situation comes adult actions and sex is part of them. So we have, to, we have to stop those things. We have to stop the bad information that is coming out of our communities to our children. I wanna put that same question to Shannon. Uh, because I think it's, it, I think we really need to explore that. We really need to begin to understand what sex sex trafficking really is, and I don't think that the definition of sex trafficking. I mean, is it the same thing as prostitution? Is it what is it? That's a great question. Um, so it can, but also it doesn't. It depends, right? Um, so I'll speak from more of the experience that I, that's been shared with me by trans women who have, you know, um, found themselves in having to engage in survival work. Let's put it that way. So when it comes to trafficking, trafficking um, typically resonates with a very particular theme, right? Which means that you have somebody with intention who is typically making money off of, um, your commerce, right? What you're doing. What happens a lot of times with trans women on the other hand is trans women find themselves in a place of my back is against the wall survival. This oftentimes happens simply because parental rejection. And I've always said, regardless of anyone's inability to understand or have empathy for the turmoil that goes on when trying to move towards becoming your authentic self, what we all here know is that you would be hard pressed to be a 16 year old having to navigate your own survival without your parents care, okay? So in turn, that leaves you so open and so exposed to having to make money the best way that you know how. Um, I'm so certain that there is trafficking in the sense that a lot of um, Black cisgender women experience. But oftentimes when it comes to trans women, um, that form of sex work is typically independent um, and centers around, I, I have to eat, I have to find a place to stay. And the other thing that I will say is this, and I'll pass it on over, Trans women are largely fetishized and objectified. Mm -hmm. And they typically are so by men who are unable to deal with their own attraction and shame and stigma. You hear so many people say things like, oh, she tricked him. No, she didn't. She did not. He, he knew exactly who he was with. He knew what he was looking for. It's the fact that the reality came crushing down on him mm -hmm. of who he was with what he had done, and I need to silence this person, I need to snuff her life out, you know? Um, so those are more times than not the incidents that happen when it comes to trans identified women. Thank you. I wanna turn attention now to- um, Mary. I'm sorry. Mary, um, I'm sorry. Can I be a little bit more clear on that? On, okay, on that you subject? can. You can. All right. Let me let me give you from my experience. I was raised and, and, and I was told things like this. As long as you've got that between your legs, you'll always be all right. When you we come up in communities that tell you your body is a sexual object. And you can always get by with your body. You come by in a community where you're raised up in a household where you always have to fight men in order to survive. Mm -hmm. You are. Uh, you're a body, you know, in whether it's your father, where it's your brothers, whether it's your cousins, you're up against the wall in black households. That's how it is for black girls. You've got uncles, you got stoke, you got people in your family that are always coming at you and touching you. You are already at a, a, a at risk for exploitation and, and subjected to sexual abuse. 
as a child. So you come up in households like that and you, you hear mothers talking about, I had to fight for my daughters to be raised, not to be touched, molested and stuff like that. That happens in our communities and we don't talk about it enough. And I was trying to be nice and civil, but I need to tell the truth. <laughs> That's true. The, top, the, the bottom line is we fight in our communities. And, and to, I, don't, to, I, don't, I don't know if we're ready to hear that. Yeah, you know, like we need to. Yes, we need to start having those yes. conversations. We need to start having yes. those we conversations. Need to hear that. Well, and we need to have them at younger ages. Um, right. If I we could just step in one minute. In our yes, you can interject. And, um, yeah. One of the things I just want to clarify that the definition of sex trafficking is any act of which um, sex is traded for something of value by force, fraud, or coercion, or the purpose induced to perform these acts, I have not obtained their 18th birthday. And so I want to clarify that because a lot of times when we talk about the misconceptions that we have around trafficking in Black communities is that there is a choice in the matter, that these are girls who are fast, that these are girls who just right. like having sex. It's the same way that you you characterize a person that's being raped as wanting it or basing it based on what she had on. And so I need to clarify that regardless to if you walk freely, if you're surviving, if your back is against the wall, if you walk into, if you advertise, if you post it, if you have not obtained your 18th birthday, you cannot consent to sell sex. And I don't care what the law says in Illinois about being 17 and able to consent to have sex, you cannot sell sex until you have reached your 18th birthday. Second clarification around these misconceptions around choice. Choice looks a lot different for everybody. When you have to choose between eating, when you have to choose between surviving, when you live in a community that is, that is everyone around you is in a gang and that gang is the trafficker. Every time you walk out the door, you have to make a choice on whether or not you wanna stay safe and survive or, you, or you're gonna, you know, you're gonna um, adhere to this force. It is forced. There is no such thing as child prostitution. So anyone that's under that age and being induced to perform these acts are victims. And mm -hmm. that is the misconception that they chose this lifestyle. Right. I want to turn it over to Miss uh, Tillett because I don't want to butcher your name again. <laughs> uh, could you uh, address the same issue but with your work surrounding picturing Black girlhood? What message did you hope you would get across to the audience and, audience, and what did you hope they would take away? Yeah, um, I would like to actually talk about Pitching Black Girlhood and, and also this altar project that we have in Chicago. Um, I'm an artist and I'm an organizer. And so I think that I think that I urge everyone in, on this call and everyone that's listening, um, how do we use our tools? How do we use our voices to really advocate for Black girls, period? Right? Like, what can we do? Yeah, I, often people will hear this and, and hear these stories and not understand where to put this on their agenda. This is an urgent issue. Um, this is a, a crisis. And I think that we need to use anything that we can to continue to advocate. Um, and so one of the things that I'm doing, actually, it's in, uh, next week, um, um, is I'm doing one of the largest um, a national exhibition on Black girls um, called Picturing Black Girlhood, I'm co curating this along with uh, Zoraida Lopez um, in, in um, Newark, New Jersey. And then it will have over 88 different artists, um, Black girls themselves, black, um, black women photographers, and really taking um, the narrative of our, ourselves and telling the stories of what Black girlhood is. Um, and really asking, I think when you leave um, this exhibition, really asking everyone to put, make sure that they put Black girls on their agenda. Okay. Thank you. Uh, anybody else want to talk about, before we move on to the next topic, want to talk about uh, some of the issues surrounding uh, sex trafficking or understanding tra sex trafficking in the community? Because this has been a subject that journalists struggle with. And I'm speaking you know, as a journalist, that when you talk about missing black women and girls and you bring up prostitution or drug use, uh, it, it outrages people. It's mm -hmm. like, they don't want you to mention it. You don't want to mention the background of this 
this person has, you know, uh, it's, it has a history of prostitution or this person has a history of drug use. You want to leave all of that out. Uh, I would like to know from the panel of experts, why is that, why should we not as journalists talk about those sorts of things when we talk about missing black women and girls? Because it gives them, it places onus and blame on the, on the victim. It changes that victim to criminal. It criminalizes normal behavior. So sometimes, and oftentimes, we got to be clear about the, who's given the background. So the background may not be the real story. I often says, I talk to people, and um, Mama Brenda have heard me say this before, trafficking is relational. And so oftentimes, when girls get into trafficking situations, that, that, is, that comes from a missing situation, we got to ask ourselves, what are they running from and who are they running to? And when we start asking those questions around what is going on, what's the background that led to them being either lured out of their homes or running from their houses, that's the whole story. Because even if we talk about, the, even if it is a situation of drug use, even if it is a situation of previous exploitation, it stems from something. And so just talking about those issues and not talking about the reason and the contributing factors for those reasons, the drug use and, and the exploitation are symptoms of something else. And if we're not gonna tell the whole story, we should focus just on the missing person and, and finding that person. Another thing we have to stop doing is, we have to understand that even if a person runs, when you stop looking for them, you have thrown them away. And so we have a, we don't just have runaways, we have throwaways. Because when it comes to black missing black missing women and girls, we stop looking immediately. And the moment that we stop looking and we turn our attention to something away, we just said that that person is not important enough for our time or our effort, and we have thrown them away. And I want to add one of the things in my book that I wrote about my life, one of the things that I pointed out in my book. When I first got abducted and I was kept by these pimps for six months, when I came back home into my home, into my home space, and I came and found out that my family, the person that I was with, had not looked for me, had not looked for me. That was more devastating for me than the kidnapping and the abduction that had happened for me, that I had not been, I wasn't worthy of being looked for. And I remember going back out because of not what had happened to me. That was, that, that was traumatizing too, but because I had not been looked for and I felt more traumatized. But what Keisha just said, what I want to add on this, mm -hmm. we're talking about missing, murdered and trafficking girls. What about the girls who've never, who've, who've never been trafficked, who've never did anything wrong, who've never, just like, the, why are they characterized as traffic, prostituted, bad girls, and all of these things, just because we know there is a heightened, a, a lot of stuff going on in our community, but we have excellent girls, good girls, who've never done anything. Yet when the police show it at our doorstep, they act as if every last one of us are involved in some type of trafficking, sexual, heightened sexual activity or anything, and they treat us as such. When they asked about the questions to the parents or the aunties or the moms, they talked to them as if their children were mm -hmm. sexually active already. And they're talking about an 11 and 12 year old girl. They asked those questions and people get livid. And I don't blame them. We're talking about good kids. But that's, those are the kind of questions they asked. But you didn't hear them when they were on the news and then they ask and they say stuff and I hear the news say stuff like allegedly and all those type of questions when it comes to a black girl. But you didn't hear that when Stacey Peterson was missing. You didn't hear that when Gabby Papatito was missing. You didn't hear any of those alleges and maybes and all of that. It was a state of emergency and let's find her. You know what I mean? It wasn't anything negative in their background that they brought up, but you'll hear the negativity in the backgrounds of an African-American girl, Hispanic girl. They'll bring up the negativity some kind of way in their family or about them. And, this, and that's wrong. 
That's wrong. Why can't we stick to the fact that they're missing and something has happened to them? Not about whatever was going on with them, because right now this is the victim. This is the person that we're looking for. But this is the way the media throws you off from thinking that she's important. She's she needs, you know, she needs the same justice as anybody else. But no, we're going to minimize it because we're going to we're going to we're going to we're going to stick a label on. it. So why do you think uh, and I'm talking this is for Candace. Why do you think and what do you think some of the reasons are why there is a lack of media coverage for missing black women and girls? Um, I, I believe that the lack of media coverage comes from how society overall portrays us, right? So it's already a stigma, like we've talked about, that we're, we're less than already because of, um, you know, we come from, according to society, we come from broken families or black women and girls, we're fast, we're not educated. So mm -hmm. we're all, we're, we're, we're already written off as less than um, as being important. So now when it comes to the media, when they talk about our, our white women, they're made household names, right? We're not made household names. We're not made um, like Gabby Petito, um, Amy Smart. Um, do that, do they get down to color? Does that get down to race? Is it, it simply a matter of race? Or is it yes, something else? It is. I'm going to say, I'm going to say, absolutely, it's race. And one of the comments that John Fountain made in my first episode, he said, if these were 51 missing dogs, that there would be much more attention to these 51 missing dogs and these 51 missing women. Um, when black girls and women, when we do get something on the news, we get like a, a 20 second blurb, mm -hmm. and then it's like, okay, then it then it then it goes away. But the Gabby Petitos, they get the hour long Dateline specials. They get just a continued coverage of uh, the way she's portrayed. She's, she's innocent, she's, and, and, and they very well maybe. I'm not trying to take that away from you know, the white girls and women who have, but it just comes down to why aren't we looked at as black women and girls as in, just as important because these, these girls and women mattered to these families. Um, they want answers, they deserve answers, and they're not getting the answers that they need from those who are supposed to protect us. Um, when I talked to the mother of Kiara Coles, the fact that she said nobody talked to, he hasn't been questioned, the boyfriend hasn't been questioned. Why not? I mean, that would be the first person you think they would talk to. Um, there's just not an urgency. We're just, we're just, we're looked at as not important at all. And it's race, yes, I do believe it's absolutely race. Barry, um, we just did a, um, a thing with um, little girl Hope, the 10 year old girl that was in front of the hotel who came out the hotel with the uh, 47 year old man. And this should have been a, 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 a shut, this should have been a shut and closed case the, the man should have been arrested. Mm -hmm. And the you know, little girl shouldn't got should have got services. And that's what should have happened. Right, right. And when the reporter Gay Savini called me about it, it, uh, t it took my breath away. I was asked to speak on her behalf because of course she was too young to speak with the media, right? Mm -hmm. But because I had had the experience of being a little girl like that in that type of situation, I was asked to be the voice for her, right? And I was more than happy to do it because it seemed like the baby and me needed to do it, right? But when I did it, I saw that it needed to be more than a voice behind her, right? So I called sisters, I called black women that I knew were going to stand up for this baby with me and we were not going to sit down until justice was uh, done. And I called Shazara Hire till it. And I called other black organizations that I knew were going to stand with me. I called Keisha, Dr. Keisha. I called women that I knew were going to be on the front and were not going to sit down on this. And we stood together for Baby Hope, right? And we stood up against the just and against CPD. Uh, um, uh, and, and DCFS, and um, we got justice for her because you, that what I'm saying is in lieu of everything else, mm -hmm. we stood as a community and we went out in front of the hotel that she was taking care of and we demanded justice for her and we demanded a media attention, attention, not just any media attention, we directed Mr. Savini and what he should be saying. We, you know, we suggested strongly, this is how you should represent this victim right. as a victim and not as, 
the point where uh, about DCF, don't let DCF and right. exactly. CPD over. We directed this, and and and, and Miss Kelly will tell you how we did that. We were very adamant about it, and we got justice for this little girl because we cared and we wanted the image of this little girl to be brought out and we didn't want to scar her across the media because she was a baby right and we were adamant about that not posting her and splashing her across the television because she was the victim and she was a baby and, and she needed the protection she needed the protection and we were clear about that and she got it and we got we went we got as far as the courts to be uh, 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 right there in the courts for her. Mm -hmm. It can be done, but we have to come together to unite like we're doing here today. We cannot do it single-handedly or go Correct. off together. Miss <laughs> Bradley Smith, yes, we can. If we and, and, I think, and I think that it will be, it, it's very important that, I'm glad WVON uh, took up the cause of, of John Fountain uh, and his idea, which is brilliant, uh, to bring his classroom in it. But it has to be a thing where you are in partnership with Black journalists. They, don't, they may not all be at Black stations or Black newspapers, but they are Black journalists in the city, and you guys need to know who they are. Yes. We work okay. in concert with them to educate us and to help us frame the stories and do what we're supposed to do so that we don't make a bad situation worse. That's, yes. I think that's the value of this, what we're doing today. That's the value of having this conference and bringing us all together so we can look eyeball to eyeball and talk about the issues that need to, we need to talk about. I want to bring Aria into the conversation. Uh, we want to talk about your short um, film that uh, you we just saw. I uh, want to talk about uh, how you came up with the idea, number one, but what were you trying to portray to the audience in regard to human trafficking with the events that unfolded in the film? What were you, what did you want us to get out of that? Of course, um, I think it was actually, it's targeted towards everyone, but I think young girls was who it was mainly targeted towards because I'm a young girl. I not gonna lie, until about two years ago, I never thought about human trafficking. I never thought it could happen to me. I didn't think it could happen to anyone close to me. And you always get Amber Alerts and you just, you brush it past. And so there was a young girl in the film who was like representing a lot of us who were like, eh, you can't really do anything about it. It's just, it, you know, yet the car was driving right past them. And then the other girl was like, well, this feels weird. And, just, but she still didn't think much of it. The car, they were at the same gas station. The guy ended up going in and following the other girl. We don't know what happens with her. But in the end, um, the other girl wakes up and the exact same situation happens to her. And it's supposed to represent these cycles that happen because we just we keep looking past it. And I, I wanted to portray that it's literally everywhere and we cannot wait until we wake up and then they're at our doorstep for us to actually care. And I remember um, Ms. Bradley Smith saying that um, we, we, it's, it, it, you can't wait until it happens to you. And that's so true because we got a shot also of the entire neighborhood just to show that it was it was a just a regular neighborhood that it was happening out of it's not this dark place in an alley in afghanistan or somewhere it's in chicago it's in park forest it's everywhere and we have to be aware so that's what i was trying to portray so um how how can you how can other people ordinary people utilize the arts to spread awareness about this issue how can we, you know, how can the arts community get involved? I'm going to ask Ms. Tilt the same question. How do ordinary people who are look, looking at this, how can they use whatever the art that they have to dress mm -hmm. it? Right. I like that you said whatever the art, because it really doesn't matter what your passion is. As long as you do have a passion and you have a passion for a cause, you can literally do anything, whether it's a talk show or just a film that you, I've never created a film before. I started out as an actress and I was playing the girl who got kidnapped, but I just took what I knew from directing and being on sets. And I was like, this is an issue that needs to be talked about. I remember you asking what made me come up with it. Um, I actually got an Amber Alert um, that week. And that was really weird because I kept getting Amber Alerts. It wasn't like, and this is so sad, but it wasn't normal in that only once a week or something. Like, it was like days after days. And then I remember that, human trafficking numbers. I started hearing stuff about that. And that prompted me to say, 
well, I'm bigger than acting, I'm bigger than directing. And I know that people listen when it comes to film because people aren't gonna engage themselves in issues that they aren't engaged. Like if they don't care, if it's not interesting, they're not gonna engage themselves. And that's why moving forward, I wanna use film to captivate audience because of the cinematic beauty, but to inspire them because of the stories. And I know that with like the Harriets and the Judas and the Black Messiahs and now Mm -hmm. Amber and what I can create more of, people will listen because you're drawing in these diverse audiences and they'll pay money to go see a film and not even know that it's sparking a conversation, it's sparking change because subconsciously we're hearing more and more stories that need to be brought to light. So I'd say just with the arts, if you have a a talent for painting, piano, whatever it is, you can collaborate, you can use your creative mind to say, okay, now how can I bring this to talk about something bigger than myself? And I'm gonna uh, tell that, thank you so much for that. Uh, it's just fascinating to see you so young and that you are so passionate about this issue. We really, really need, we just need to spread you around the city so that other young people could, could get involved. Uh, and so I would uh, ask you still the same thing, but I would add, how can we, how can young people get involved? Oh yeah, I mean, I actually think young people are leading this for us. I want to want to say that not only are we um, supporting young people, but they're actually doing this work. They're leading this work, um, particularly here in Chicago. One of the first like missing and um, murdered black women and girls marches was led by a, a seventh grader um, at, um, at, at Kenwood Oak, Oakland Community Organization. And so I want to say that, like, I work with young people. Um, I, this poem, actually, since you were talking about art, I want to share this, this line from this poem that one of our young girls, who was 15 years old, wrote it at the time, um, Angelina Devon. Um, when Amber went missing, they made an alert after her. When Shakora went missing, they did nothing. It, this makes sense. The disappearing of Black girls have gone on for centuries. And so that that line in that poem like literally echoes in my head like the fact that our young girls know that if something happens no one will be looking for them right um and so that motivates me to use all the things that i have as an organizer as an artist to kind of start doing doing something about that right i can't just hear a stat that that 30 percent or 34 percent of black girls and women are represent the missing murder cases and not do something like how do we hear that and not want to do something you know about that and so the arts is my tool i mean the arts is a very powerful tool i don't know what we would have done with that during this whole pandemic it's a, it's a tool to help us heal it's a tool to help us uh gather people community together and it's a tool to help motivate and and bring it to a larger platform um that people may not be able to hear um and so I think that's a really, really important thing. One of the things that we did is um, is create an altar during the pandemic for missing and murdered Black women and girls. And so we were trying to expose it to a new audience. It's at the Museum of Contemporary Arts right now. Um, and the first thing that we did with that altar was we brought it with Brenda Myers uh, was talking about this case that we worked on that she asked me to help her with um, around Hope, a girl that was sex trafficked. Um, and we brought this altar there. We brought it to the place where she was last seen. Um, we brought it to the reporters. We brought it, um, we started it there. And then we now have it at the museum and a whole different audience is being engaged with young people um, to talk about something that is really, really important in our community. So I just really, I, I gotta say with that case, even with Hope, we didn't necessarily know what to do. Um, but what we did is that we knew that we didn't have all the answers, but we knew that if we work together, like Brenda said, if we work together that we can figure out the solutions with our tools, the skills that we have. Um, because oftentimes, unfortunately, um, as we heard again and again, that the police are not doing anything about this, that they have failed us again and again. And so I, I encourage everyone um, to figure out, to be upstanders, that this is their issue. One of the things that I, I did for the last five years is I went to Minnesota and I, I was in solidarity with the indigenous women and girls and I would go to the missing and murdered marches um, and to figure out tools to bring that back to Chicago um, and to understand that these two populations, indigenous women and girls, Latinos and black are disproportionately impacted by this, right? And so what if we 
showed up for each other. Um, and I learned so many skills about, you know, because they're kind of, they are or, uh, much, much more organized around this issue. And I learned about bringing our spirituality, uh, bringing our, like, our, our uh, legislative leaders around these issues, um, and bringing our arts. And so I, I would take young, young people from Chicago to Minnesota um, each year. Uh, we actually did it virtually last year, this March, um, for Missing and Murdered, um, just to be in solidarity and learn about these issues. So I just want to just encourage everyone um, that we should not work in silos that this issue really impacts us all. And we don't have to be a black women and girls to, to show up for, for this, right? That we should have everyone that this, when someone goes missing in our neighborhood, it impacts us all. Like our parents who, some of them have kids that are missing and some of them don't, but the fear that they have around safety, um, because this is an issue in their community, deeply impacts all the choices that they make. And so, you know, I, I just, again, I think it's, it doesn't take too much, but what you should do is do something. Right. I want to bring Dr. Uh, Keisha back in uh, with a question about the specific mental health needs of the families and communities impacted by the epidemic of missing black women and girls. And what can friends and families and as a community, what can we do to uh, help, help these families? So one of the things um, everyone has talked about today is the trauma that's inflicted by exploitation, um, the guilt and the shame. When you return back, um, Brenda Myers Powell spoke about the guilt of coming back into a family after, you know, the shame that's po placed upon a person coming back to that family after an exploited situation or even a missing situation. One of the things that we can stop doing is asking why. Why did you go? Why? Stop oh. asking why. Why mm -hmm. is not the why is not necessary. Their story is not necessary. We have to stop sensationalizing pain. You know, we have to start bringing um, healing and not making it something that is entertaining, sensationalizing someone else's poverty, someone else's pain, because there isn't, there is the, um, what leads young people into these situations is their vulnerabilities. And in black communities, we have more vulnerabilities than other communities. We have poverty. We have a history of um, incarceration of families and parents. We have a history of um, young people being involved in authoritative care systems. We have a history of sexual abuse in the home, seasoning and grooming before they ever meet a, a, a trafficker or a pimp. And so those are the things that we have to address as a community. These are not individual situations. This is a systematic situation that has affected our community for years and years and years to come. And so I think that one of the things that we must do, we must start getting help for people for our, our young people or women when they come back into the community. We can treat we can treat each other, we can treat victims of a community within a community and bring awareness to that community all at the same time. That does not have to be different, different aspects of the healing process. We have to start learning to heal together and heal regardless of whether we know why. Okay. Right, what about law enforcement? I'm sorry, go ahead, Brendan. And let me give you an example. I did a focus group with uh, girls, right? And one of the main things, and I get this when I do, when I put this question out there, I said, what would you like to see change in your community? And the girls, and, and, and you, you ask, we, we, they educate us. I said, what would you like to see change in your community? We'd like for old men to stop messing with us. Oh, that's and I, and I mean, this is what they'd like to see change in our community. We'd like to walk freely in our community with all, without old men messing with us, driving up on us, making us scared to walk to school, scared to walk from school, because they're trying to make a difference in their lives. And they said old men are approaching them two, two deep, three deep in a car. They're in fear. They're in fear. They don't want that. They don't want the attention. They don't want it at all. They want to be left alone to feel comfortable in their communities. And that's something that you, these guys have got to know. They don't want that attention. They don't want this to happen. I remember when I was growing up, unfortunately, we don't have no, no, no more of those neighborhood watch. They didn't allow that kind of thing. There were people in the neighborhood, oh, leave that girl alone. There's no more of that. How do we... 
how do we protect our beautiful young girls anymore? We, 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 we've got to help our girls. They are we traumatizing the men them in groups. We have, to, we have to hold the men in our community accountable to protect our girls. Is. Because a young girl being approached by an older man, they can't stop. They, they don't have the power. That's a power dynamic that, they, that exists within there. They can't stop that. But another man that. observing that behavior can step to that guy and say, don't talk to that young lady like that. That's a young queen. Don't treat her like that. Don't whistle at her. Allow her to go through the neighborhood. When, when, when we start standing up in our communities and say, we're not going to allow you to do these type of things, I guarantee you it will stop. A young and girl don't have a chance with an older guy. Right, and go it's been and going forth. on for a very long time. Yes. I, I'll be 73 this year, and I can still remember, I can still remember walking at Group in a Housing Project. I can still remember having the fear in my heart when I had to walk past a group of Black men, uh, much older than I was, when I had to walk past and they would cat call and make, you know, terrible lewd remarks. And if you didn't respond to them, they would throw objects at you. That's how bad it was. And that's how long it's been going on. You know, and we have allowed it to, we have allowed it to go on in our community. I want to, we're going to be moving on in a minute, but I want to uh, give you guys an opportunity, the experts, an opportunity that, to give some final remarks. Uh, on this subject of of black women and black girls being missing in our community, what can law enforcement do better? So that was one of the questions that. So one of the things that law enforcement can do better is they can stop they can stop um, using words like missing and runaway. If a person is gone, they're gone. And so when we start putting these labels around young people when they're out of the home, then missing says that I'm a victim. Runaway means I chose to leave. And so right, right. the attention that those young people get based on how they characterize them leaving or, or not being readily available in their home changes the trajectory of the cases. We have to stop doing that. As law enforcement, please, please, please stop telling people they gotta wait 24 hours for someone mm -hmm. if someone goes missing. That's just not, that doesn't make sense. So if a person walks out of the house and get and so just think about the carjacking. Someone put something about the carjackings. If a person, if a young person is in a car and a car is and it's a carjacking to take place, and that person is in the car, you don't have to wait 24 hours to report that car missing. So why would you have to wait 24 hours to report a person missing? We have to start holding law enforcement accountable. If my child walks out of the house and does not return in 10 minutes, I'm worried. 24, 24 minutes is too, I mean 24 hours is way too long. And so we have to stop, stop allowing that. We can't keep allowing law enforcement to tell us when we should be worried, when we should be alarmed, when they should start looking. Law enforcement is paid to serve and protect. And I want my protection immediately. <laughs> so I will, um, I'll say this so from, from a trans woman's perspective, because mm -hmm. I've worked with law enforcement before and so have so many other folks who do this boots on the ground work every day. There's no investment, none. So I heard the reoccurring theme here around race, couple that with identity. You are completely thrown away. There is the idea, there is the belief that trans women don't have anyone that cares about them. That is a complete lie. The last murder that was solved since 1999 was Dijanae Staden. And that was just about two years ago. That's mm -hmm. unacceptable. 1999 was the last murder that was solved of a trans woman. Save Dijanae Stanton, which was about, like I said, about two years ago. There is no investment, you know? So I'm hearing what everybody is saying. Um, and I know that to be true. But when you talk about a trans woman, there, there is nothing. When you bring up these topics in, in these conversations, there is radio silence. There is a disconnect. There is the notion of, well, you didn't have to experience that. You kind of walked into that. You didn't have to live that life. Mm -hmm. So see, again, what I notice over and over again is trans women, LGBTQ folks show up for everybody's injustices, right? 
We are the first folks who are holding signs, who are waving banners, who are standing arms locked. But where are folks when it comes to us? You know, there are folks out here, like amazing organization, Brave Space, who does work every single day. I'm not pointing fingers, but I'm just saying, I don't see folks show up in droves for the justice of trans women. I don't see folks saying, why hasn't this murder been solved yet? What are you all doing? Trans women's parents cry just like everybody else. Trans women's parents rush to the phone, hoping to see, is this my baby just like everybody else? Trans women's mothers cry, lean over caskets, inconsolable just like everybody else. You know, but yet and still, there is still this idea of, well, you know what? I mean, you, you, you kind of did that. There is no virtue when it comes to thinking about a trans woman, right? There's always some type of victim shaming, victim blaming. You did this to yourself. No, no. This was done by somebody who wanted to heap hatred onto another person's body for whatever reason it was, you know? But that is the thing right there, mm -hmm. is that we have to stop disconnecting. I guess as Desmond Tutu said, right? My humanity is bound into yours, okay? And when you do not focus on the humanity of others, you by virtue of that have dehumanized yourself, you know? So I'll just leave it right there. Thank you. So and we are going to add with, um, with uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Mary. But That's okay, Brenda, we want to hear from you. I, Shannon, I want to add, you know, I stand with you because I service trans women myself. And for me in human trafficking, violence to trans women is violence to women because I know, I know specifically trans women don't, they don't get violence toward them until they put on the drag. When they put on their, 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 they can work as men, but once they put on the makeup and the drag, that's when the, that's when the violence comes. So you got to connect that to being a female. They don't get the, they don't get that. They don't get the violence and they could work as a, a dressed as a boy, but they choose to be who they want to be. And I, and, and, and knowing who they are, some of them are educated as, but they can't get the job and be who they want to be. That's why they're out there. And I, I'm with them all the time and see the struggle, just like a lot of my girls, they, it's the, it's the struggle, but three times the challenge for them, you know? It's and funny. I stand with you on that. So oh, I know, Brenda. The last thing I'm going to, the last thing I'll say this is. Conversation. We haven't finished with this conversation. Yes. We still, there's more to come. Uh, okay. We got to bring in the families, uh, have okay. them have their say. Uh, and right now we're going to move to a breathing exercise. So we're going to have our final breathing exercise coming up. And then we're going to have a creative performance by Selena Christiana, Girls for Gender Equity, a national gender for Black girls. So let's go to Shelly. Um, just grounding ourselves and centering ourselves with everything that we've been hearing. I'm gonna ask y'all to just place a hand or both your hands on your heart and give to your heart whatever it is you need in this moment. Whether you feel like your heart is bleeding, whether you feel like your heart has been ripped open, whether you feel like your heart feels love in this moment, just please give all of the love to your heart. And as we do this breathing, um, I want you to be able to hold your heart um, send all the energy that you can to it because what we are hearing is not light. What we are hearing is about humanity. It is about um, how so many people have been disposed of within systems and what it means to really hold our hearts as we're listening to these stories and hold our hearts as we're thinking about these folks that are in these different spaces and how everything is interconnected, everything is relative um, as Black folks in this space, what it means to show up for ourselves also means we are showing up for the other people who need to be shown up for in this space as well. So. We're gonna do this last breath exercise and whether you need to rub your heart in this space, whether you need to tap your heart in this space, um, tapping, it's EFT is an emotional freedom. 
um, technique. And if you just need to tap it to awaken your heart to feel some sensation there, whether you felt numb um, over time, I'm just gonna ask you to hold your heart and do a deep inhale through your nose and push it out through your mouth. So if your heart is feeling heavy, just give it some love. Do another deep inhale through your nose and pushing it out through your mouth. One more deep inhale through your nose and exhaling it through your mouth. As we center ourselves in this space, we do not always get a moment to take a pause. Oftentimes the experience as a black person, as a black woman, as a black femme is oftentimes on the go. We are always doing the work for other people. We are always doing the work for ourselves and it just can feel so constant. So in this moment, I hope that you have had some breath to remind you of your humanity, remind you that you are seen in this space. You are important in this space. Everyone who is connected to you is important in this space. And I just wanna say thank you all for being here and hope that your heart feels whatever it is needed in this space. Thank you. Uh, Selena? Hi, all right. I will be sharing my piece called Roses for Prosperity. We as black girls are the only flowers on this earth that are grown and watered. Awaken to the world, to the reality of what we live with. I've learned that as a black girl, not only do I possess a divine female energy, but I am the divine female energy. I am brilliant, I am powerful, I am driven, I am fierce, I am perseverant, I am unshakable, and I am resilient. I am truly divine. As Shakur once said, Long live the rose that grew from concrete when no one else ever cared. And this is my policy priority that we stand for at Girls for Gender Equity. Whenever our main policy priorities here at Girls for Gender Equity is focused on ending gender-based violence. Gender-based violence is defined as a detrimental act perpetrated against a person because of their gender. Gender inequality, abuse of authority, and destructive norms are at the basis of it. Gender-based violence is a severe violation of human rights as well as a serious health and safety concern. Thank you so much, Selena. Thank you. Uh, and, and, and I, could please forgive me, but I forgot to inter properly introduce you. You are a high school sophomore. Selena is a high school sophomore from Brooklyn, New York who's both passionate and committed to ending gender-based violence and being a voice for young women who've experienced sexual harassment. Let's give her a hand for her. Thank you so much, Selena. Okay, so we are at the point where we wanna bring all of our, our, our panelists and the, the um, people who shared, the family members who shared uh, their pain, their journey that they're on trying to, to get justice for their and the return of their loved ones. Uh, we're at the point we want to bring you all together so we can ask some more questions and let you have a final say, a final share, if you will, of what we should be doing as uh, community members to address this crisis issue. Uh, I want uh, specifically to talk to, to start it off, the family members, I will start with um, Ms. Phillips. Uh, my question is, what did you have to do to get attention from law enforcement? Uh, and that may seem like we've addressed it already, but we need specific steps. If this were to happen to me, if tomorrow, if, this, if I had to face this tomorrow, what is it that I should do first of all, to attract the attention of law enforcement. What did you have to do? And that is for Karen Phillips, are you still here? Uh, 
Okay, if Miss is Miss Phillips still here? Okay, you're uh, muted. Okay, yes, I'm still here. Okay. All right, what did you have to do? I mean, it's almost like we need a step by step. What did you have to do to get the attention of law enforcement? Um, well, if you ask me, I really haven't got the attention from them, but you know, my attention mainly been through the news and social media. So law enforcement is, you know, the attention was the very first day when I called it, um, did the well-being check. So after that, it's just been nothing because when they turned it over from missing person to homicide, they told me that they would re-interview everybody. They still haven't re-interviewed nobody but me. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, no, I'm else? saying I haven't got any attention from them. What about um, Miss Bradley Smith? Well, um, early on when Tianda and Diamond were missing, uh, Mary, you were there. Mm -hmm. They pretty much listed Yonder and Diamond as a runaway, which I immediately had to change. There's no such thing, in my opinion, as a 10-year-old running away with a three-year-old. Mm -hmm. And I live in Minnesota, and I was living in Minnesota when they got missing. Mm -hmm. As soon as I seen it on WGN, I hit the highway. Uh, the media was there, but you have to keep a constant uh, connection with media people. Mm -hmm. um, you can't be refusing granting interviews with nobody. You know, get on the telephone, get on your internet, which I didn't even have a Yahoo address. I didn't even know what it was. But over time, Mm -hmm. I learned how to navigate with the computer and the social media to reach not just national, but international news as well. Be willing to say, okay, I have to drop everything I have at home, which I mean, a lot of people don't know this, but um, I was actually <laughs> evicted twice out of an apartment because I was jumping up my in different uh, cities. I've lost several jobs mm -hmm. because when I got to go, I got to go. If they're willing to do an interview, I'm willing to be the interviewed person because you have to advocate for your missing. And network, just like you're doing on Facebook, network, but it's not just Facebook. There's Tic Tac, Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, reach out to the postal service, reach out to Walmart, reach out to any avenue that you think that will put them up there. But I must say this, it's so disheartening when I walk through the cities of Chicago, the city of Chicago and every other block, there's a, a gin commercial, beer commercial, some type of billboard on the side of a building or fried chicken about getting the community drunk or high or feeding them. We need those people to step in and start putting our missing persons on there as well. That's a good idea. Because if I could walk from 47th, well, drive from 47th to 95th, why is it every place I look, there's a liquor store sign, there's an EBT sign ready to take our Black people money, but they don't want to post our Black people missing posters. Mm -hmm. This has to stop. But again, use the media to your ability, even when the police are difficult, take your media people with you. Yes, because the police can be difficult. If, if I'm saying they're difficult and I've been around for 30 years, Getting them to take to give you any information is just you almost have to twist arms. You got to threaten. You got to use all the little power that you have in order to get them to respond. So you're absolutely right. You do, and you do need those media people to do exactly that in order to get anything done. Take them with you always, always. You know, like um, now we have a very good um, investigator, but since this 21 years, we've had investigators to die, retire, and you have to start over with the new person coming in. 
make yourself available. Talk to the National Center. Talk to the new investigator. Don't just assume that what well, a case is handed over, they know about it. No, take take the time to go down to the station, introduce yourself and say, this is what I need to be done because they'll fall through the cracks if you don't. Ms. Howard? Mute. We can't hear you. I see now. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes, I, can. I apologize. That's I okay. apologize. Um, the way I was able to get the media involved is uh, the calls to the, uh, the media station by my friends and family members. I took to Facebook and then I had the CEO of ComEd to assist me. But it's, it's after a while, they said Jericho was no longer breaking news. So I had maybe about a week. But what I was told is you have visuals. Uh, you hand out flyers, you let the media know when you're going to do these things in hopes that they will come out, come out to support. But other than that, I haven't had much success other than doing a visual or um, handed out flyers. Okay. Well, I mean, um, even with that, each family member um, even though like when I do a vigil for Tiana and Diamond or do something for them, I never fail to, met, to mention somebody else that's missing. See, even though we have some missing, mention somebody else because that somebody else could be picked up through that media stream as well because somebody may not even know about them like Diamond and King Walker. Right. I mentioned Jasmine Ackery. I try to mention... Uh, everybody as much as possible, but when you're talking to the media and um, Mary, you might agree with this. When you talk to them, media have a way of editing what you say True. and taking it out. Make sure that whatever you're going to say, it'll be incomplete so they can't take it out. <laughs> I mean, that's a trick I had to learn because if I'm trying to convey this one idea, I don't want them to just zoom in on that. No, I'm going to I'm going to integrate a part in there, whereas they have to show it in order for the idea or the conception to be complete. And unfortunately, we have to learn those skills. Why? Because we got missing people. And like I tell everybody, when I was a little girl, they would, you know, to how people would say, what you going to be when you grow up? Oh, a doctor or a firefighter, or I'm going to be a nurse. I never in my worst dreams thinking I would grow up being the aunt of two missing children. Well, thank you so much for sharing today. I know it wasn't easy. We really do appreciate it. Uh, this is valuable information. And I'm sure that the people who have tuned into this, if you did, if you just getting late and you missed it, uh, you have to retrace it on YouTube. I'm going to turn it over to uh, April, and she's going to give our next closing remarks and statements. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell and the panel. Definitely, um, Ms. Howard, Ms. Phillips, and Ms. Bradley Smith uh, for joining us today. Ms. Brenda, Dr. Kisha, Shannon, Aria. Um, my name is Candace and Shaharazad. Thank you definitely very much for everybody for um, sharing your stories and giving your expert advice for joining us today as we um, approach this very important subject. I also want to thank everyone who came as participants and attendees today. Um, this is a Saturday morning, so I'm definitely happy that you gave up your time. Um, Shelly, for those wonderful breathing exercises to bring us in a calm space. And Tahia and Selena for sharing your poetry with us this morning. Um, so if you are, as Ms. Mitchell just mentioned, if you were not able to log into the entire forum, or if you know family and friends that weren't able to attend, please let them know to go to Congresswoman Kelly's YouTube page. Um, and it'll be the, the whole, you can see it in its entirety. Also, we'll have a link from her website to take you there. And the, all of the information that you saw in the chat, 
we also will have that um, in on the link on the website. So you'll be able to pull up all the information. I know a lot of the tips, organizations that people should go to have been going on in the chat. So mm -hmm. please, we will not let you miss all of that information. So you will have it definitely on the chat. Um, so I also, um, before we leave, we have information. We have a toolkit that we want you to share with your family and friends. And maybe it definitely will be great information for you also. Um, so the toolkit is not my girl's toolkit. We also have a QR code. I'm not sure when we're gonna put it up, but we'll put it up. Okay, the QR code is up here right now. So you can do the QR code and it will take you to this on Congresswoman Kelly's website also. So you don't have to write everything down. We have everything for you that you can link to. So I'm gonna go over the toolkit. So just, you know, so you can get kind of familiar with what we have. So we have, to, you have to set up an SOS, an emergency setting for your phone. You can quickly share your location, emergency contacts. Um, when you're walking around and you go in places, avoid isolated areas and distractions. You know, try to stay on busier streets, well-lit streets. Don't be looking at your phone. Always be aware of what you're doing and what's around you. Pay attention to your surroundings. My husband tells me this all the time because I'm always walking on my phone, doing something. He was like, stay alert. Mm -hmm. so I'm definitely, I, I always think of my husband when I'm walking around. Um, carry a portable body, battery chart. Don't let your phone go dead because that is your contact to the world. You know, back when we were growing up, we didn't have, I didn't have a cell phone, but now that we have this, this technology available to us, Make sure it doesn't go to waste because the phone is dead. It's no help to us. Let everybody stay connected. Let everybody know where you're going. Keep your family and friends aware of your location, either by telling them when you're going, sharing plans, or sharing your phone's location. Usually when I'm going somewhere, especially at night, I'm on the phone with my husband or my, my mother or my sister. Someone knows I, as I'm driving around, I let someone know where I am. I'm on the phone. Mm -hmm. um, and tell your family and friends how to stay safe. We're sharing you this information. Please share it with them. Um, be careful online. Avoid posting all your personal information. Everyone likes to share. That's not always good <laughs> on social media. Please do not let every know, everyone know where you are, your location, your plan, because that, that lets somebody know where to go get you or where you are. Um, be very cautious. You know, you get these model calls with these undisclosed locations, these parties with these secret locations, these video auditions. Have your spider senses go up. Be very cautious. Don't always run to them. Make sure where you're going, where it is. Don't just like, okay, I'll give you your, in, your instructions after you do this, after you do this. You know, you need to know everything up front and let everybody know. When you have to get an Uber or a Lyft, Make sure you, you verify the model, the license, the plate number, the driver photo. Make sure you have that. Because I know when I get a lift, I'm looking at the license plate number, I'm looking at the person, looking at the phone. Then you ask them, who are you picking up? So they should have your information. So they should say, hey, I'm picking up April Williams Luster. If they don't tell me, then I don't get in the car. And share, always share with your family and friends. And then if you're in a routine, switch up your schedule. Don't always take the same street, leave at the same time, always switch it up. Because if someone knows your routine, it's easy to track it. If they've been watching you for a week or a couple of days, they know April is gonna leave work at 445 and go down Stony Island or take Lakeshore Drive or go down being right. They know me, so they can track me. So always try to switch it up. Um, drive smart. If you see a disabled vehicle on the road, don't pull over to help. Call someone, call the police, call the authorities, let them help. Park in well lit areas. And then we have helpful resources for you. Safe online service. This teaches your children or students how to safely interact on the internet. This is very good. Um, National Human Trafficking Resource Center. We have the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. National Domestic Violence Hotline. And what we will add is, um, Brave Space Alliance also. We have a long way home, long walk home, I'm sorry. Girls for Gender Equity, the Dreamcatcher Foundation, and submit a tip to Chicago Police Department. So if you think that we need to add anything else, 
please let us know. Put it in the chat. We want to make sure um, that we get out all the information to everyone. Definitely. So please, please, um, we want to thank everyone for joining us today. And we do not want this conversation to stop. We don't want it to end here. Let's keep it going. We hope you host your own forum with your family, friends, classmates, coworkers, church family, sororities, fraternities, professional and social organizations, book club, take it to the hair salon conversation, the barbershop, et cetera. We want you to keep this conversation going. It could be around the dinner table with your family at night. We will be sending out a survey with, with the next 30 to 60 days, asking what have you done with the information you received today? And when you come back to us on your survey, we will post those events on Congresswoman Kelly website and social media pages. So everyone knows this conversation has not stopped here. Please, we cannot allow this conversation to end here. Let's keep it going. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. And is it bittersweet that I log off today as my last day of event with Congresswoman Robin Kelly? I definitely enjoyed and was very privileged to work with Congresswoman Kelly for the last three years. I'm about to tear up right now. And um, I look forward to continuing this effort and conversation when I go to the mayor's office. Thank you and very much, everyone. Thank you.